Welcome to Child Care Rockstar Radio. I am your host, Chris Murray. Child care leaders around the globe are breaking through challenges, leading the way in innovation, testing new best practices, and impacting children and families in a much more powerful and positive way than ever before. Each week, join me for interviews with early childhood leaders and experts that will leave you inspired to become the next child care rock star. Now, let's go. This is episode 82 of Child Care Rockstar Radio, featuring Dr. Calvin Moore. Hey, everybody. This is your host, Chris Murray. How are you? We are into September and probably one of the craziest Septembers on record with regard to how school systems and child care centers are getting back into the groove in a fall back to school season. So I want to shout out to you if you are just feeling inundated, overwrought, super stressed, and every day brings a different, potentially unpleasant adventure. So I'm just shouting out to you to give you a virtual hug uh, here in September of 2020. And we are all um, just trying to get through this together one day at a time, guys. So hang in there. We're here to bring you tools and strategies and stories to uplift you here on the podcast today. And we're going to do just that. You're going to love my interview with Dr. Calvin Moore. He's quite a special human, and I can't wait to introduce him to you. The podcast today is sponsored in part by Honest Buck Accounting. Is the financial side of your business taking you away from what you love about it? Honest Buck frees you up to get back to the business you love and grow it. Honest Buck Accounting is your full service accounting partner from payroll to forecasting, from budgeting to tax preparation. They offer a variety of services to meet your early childhood business needs as it grows. Their experienced team comes alongside your child care business to free you up. And that's all they do is work on accounting and bookkeeping and tax prep services for early learning businesses, period, the end. So definitely check them out. By visiting honestbuck.com forward slash Chris Murray. That's honestbuck.com forward slash Chris Murray. And when you do, you might be able to win a $1,000 scholarship from them. Uh, So go check it out and register your center to win. So we're into episode 82 and uh, Dr. Calvin Moore is my guest today. He's been in the world of early learning for several decades. He is a Head Start expert and somebody who came up through the ranks of the Head Start experience as a child in Head Start in in the early days, back in the late 60s, early 70s. And he shares his story of how being a Head Start child impacted him so deeply with a friendship of his early learning teacher, one of the the teachers in the program, befriended his family and they've stayed friends until she passed. Um, And he was, she was a huge influence in his life. And so that story is shared on today's podcast. And we talk a lot about Head Start. We talk about the uh, book that Dr. Moore wrote called Men Do Stay and the influence that male teachers can have on a program. So a topic that we haven't really covered too much in the podcast is talking about male early learning teachers and some myths and stigmas around male teachers for the little ones. And you're going to love that conversation. Many of you are actively seeking and love having more male energy in in terms of teachers in your program and administrators. And so we talk through that and uh, we'll give you some ideas for how you might be able to attract a more diverse workforce, whether it's uh, a racially diverse or gender diverse workforce. So I think you're gonna love that. And we talk about uh, leadership in an early learning environment and some ideas for how to cultivate your leadership skills, really more of a a lifetime of learning and sharpening your saw around leadership. We talk most of all about the beloved 
CDA. And the CDA that was created out of Head Start as a foundational certification for uh, early learning teachers and administrators. We talk about how many people currently hold the CDA and its history, its golden years, and how you could be more active in supporting the Child Development Associate degree, the CDA. So getting that credential for all of your staff, and we talk through how you can support that as a leader and how you can bring a higher level of quality into your program just by getting familiar and supporting the CDA credential. So with all of that, I know that you're going to love this episode and we're going to dig right in. But before we do, I just wanted to remind you that uh, with the timing of this launch, of this release of this episode, we are in the throes of ticket sales, ticket selling uh, registration for our Child Care Success Summit. It's called the uh, Child Care Reimagined Virtual event. And it's a three-day virtual experience like nothing else. It just is going to be an incredible time with Simon Sinek and myself and breakout workshops. And Trent Shelton is another amazing motivational speaker. Three days of energy, fun, motivation, and nuts and bolts learning. We're going to do sessions on uh, trying to get your team more bought in. We're going to do sessions on how to use and get started with email marketing, uh, which many of you still are not using. And that's a tried and true practice for getting and staying full in any economy. We're going to talk about developing your leadership team and many, many, many more sessions. So we've got about six breakout workshop speakers in addition to myself, in addition to three keynotes, and all the sessions, and you can learn more about the titles and the descriptions of everything you're going to learn on this three days, the Child Care Reimagined Virtual Summit event at childcaresuccesssummit.com. And you can get registered right now for $197 per person, which is extremely low. Uh, our normal ticket prices for our live events go for $697 and up typically. And so you can not only save money on travel costs, you can have an incredible re-energized virtual experience from the pleasure of your own office or home, um, October 14th, 15th, and 16th with us. So join us, come on in. We are expecting a couple thousand leaders to join us, uh, owners and directors, and you can bring your entire team of administrators to this at a very low cost. You could consider it a uh, team retreat and really network with thousands of other leaders across our globe. It is gonna have an international audience and we're just super excited about it. So again, childcaresuccesssummit.com. Don't miss out because as of September 30th, tickets will go up. And also we need you to register prior to the 30th so that we can send you our swag box of goodies and fun and your event workbook. So if you want a awesome box shipped to you for this event to participate at the highest level, you got to get registered by September 30th. So write that down, mark the date, and let's hang out for three days in an incredible virtual conference like nothing else you've ever experienced. I guarantee you that. All right, everybody, let's dive in. Let's meet Dr. Calvin Moore. You're going to love him just as much as I do. Enjoy. Welcome back to Child Care Rockstar Radio. This is your host, Chris Murray, and we're into episode 82. And I'm excited today. I'm super jazzed to feature an incredible guest, Dr. Calvin Moore. Dr. Moore, how are you? I'm doing well, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be on your show today. I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, Where are you right now? I'm actually in Washington, D.C. Okay. And that's where you live, I'm assuming. Well, I live in Alabama, but I'm working in D.C. this week because we had some critical things that we needed to get done. You know, I'm a new CEO, and so Mm -hmm. I was chomping at the bit to get in the office The pandemic sort of delayed that. So I've really been working from home in Alabama. 
Gotcha. Uh, but I happen, you happen to catch me in DC this week. <laughs> Well, excellent. And you look fantastic. Let me share a few highlights about your career and your bio with the listeners. You were most recently named interim CEO of the Council for Professional Recognition, which is the organization that offers the CDA, the Child Development Associate, credential. And prior to that, you led the Office of Head Start within the Administration for Children and Families for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And your responsibilities included leading the largest region in the country, providing oversight, monitoring, training, and technical assistance to over 350 Head Start and Early Head Start grantees with a portfolio of over $1.6 billion. So that was a huge job. How long did you do that job? I was only in that job for a year before okay. I became the interim CEO. But as you know, I have over 25 years experience in the Head Start arena. Excellent. We're going to dig into that on today's podcast. And then also, as I was learning more about you, I found out that you're the author of several books, including a book called Men Do Stay, Recruiting and Retaining Qualified Male Early Childhood Teachers, which is a very popular topic amongst our listeners. And also a couple titles that you wrote in what was uh, called the Find Your Happy series, which I found quite engaging and cool. We actually have that in common, Dr. Moore, because I'm a co-author of the Happiness Guide for Early Childhood Educators. So we are trying to help teachers have positive, happy mindsets. So you and I have that in common. That is absolutely fabulous. So we (laughs) should be, this should be a fabulous interview because we're both happy, right? Absolutely. Uh, I get asked that a lot. How do you stay so happy, especially in 2020? Um, a topic for another podcast. Uh, so did you just, did you dress up and look so sharp today just to be on the podcast or are you, are you going to the church? What's going on, Dr. Moore? What's so happening? I don't know how to answer that. I did <laughs> put on my best digs just for you, Chris, but on my way to this show, I had a couple of uh, photo shoot opportunities with our videography here at the council. Uh, being the new CEO, we wanted to take some pictures. So Yes, I did dress up for you and your audience, but I had a couple of gigs before I got here. Nice. And another cool thing about this particular show is that this is the very first show that I am recording from our new office, a corporate office, what I call our podcast and mastermind studio. We have a training center upstairs. It's brand new. And this awesome reclaimed wood wall which um, is going to be branded with some more cool branding soon. But you're the first guest at the new studio. So welcome wow. in to our new, our new vibe here at Child Care Rockstar Radio. So let's talk a little bit about your ECE journey. You mentioned that you have been in the early Head Start slash Head Start arena for a couple decades. Uh, tell us, just take us back and give us some highlights of your journey in early learning and education, if you would. Well, I always like to start my journey with the fact that I was a Head Start child in 1969. So I think that really started my journey in the Head Start arena. Uh, I started working in a Head Start program in 1991, earned my CDA in 1992, and I just worked my way up in the Head Start uh, management field. I was a teacher for many years and then was promoted to center manager. I've been an ed specialist and ed coordinator. I've been a Head Start director at several programs. Um, And then I was an executive director on the East and the West Coast. Um, And and then I took a little reprieve from Head Start and became the child care administrator for the state of Alabama. And ultimately that job Um, landed me another opportunity in the federal government as the deputy director of the Office of Child Care. So I took a breather from Head Start for a couple of years, uh, but Head Start gets you right back. And as you uh, read in my bio, I most recently was the regional program manager for the Office of Head Start in Atlanta uh, before being named uh, the CEO here at the council. Mm -hmm. So my Head Start journey began in 1969 as a child but uh, I started working for the program in 1991. Awesome. And you are an example of what Head Start is all about, in my opinion, which is helping children of you know, all walks of life have amazing opportunities. And you've had quite an amazing life so far. 
And um, I'm just thrilled to have you here to get to know you better. Talk a little bit about your home life. What do you enjoy doing in Alabama? And anything that you'd like to share about what goes on at home? Well, my home is pretty busy. I have a wife and two kids. I love Alabama. My wife is from the Philippines and she absolutely loves Alabama too. I think there's some parts of Alabama that are very rural and she really likes the rural part of our state. So it reminds her of home. Uh, So I I think I picked the right uh, wife and the right place to live. However, I just took this fancy job in DC. So we'll see how that goes. I don't think uh, she's gonna like DC as much as she likes Alabama. Alabama. Uh, Another interesting thing about my household is that we did not plan it, but I have a 19 year old and a 10 year old. And so we have a college student and a fifth grader in the house at the same time. So that Uh can be like rock and roll on a Saturday night. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. So how much time right now are you spending and splitting between your two spots, between your role in DC and, and home? Are you like flying on an airplane and coming home and then doing that gig or, and especially during COVID times? Uh, yeah, you said you work from home a lot, so that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. So the entire uh, office at the council is remote now. So we're all working from home. Um, cool. But uh, I happened to be in D.C. this week, as I said earlier, because of some uh, interesting work that we needed to get done at the council. So this was my first trip to D.C. and my first uh, trip on an airplane since uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And I will tell you, it was a little bit... Um, I had some anxious moments on the plane. Mm -hmm. Um, And so traveling during the pandemic is um, necessary, I think, for some people because Mm -hmm. of essential business roles that they may have. But it is quite um, a different matter now traveling on an airplane. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I have not done it yet. I am planning to go to California end of next week. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a turbulent, anxiety-ridden uh, time for all of us. And let's talk a little bit about your new role as interim CEO. Um, what are some of the main goals that you have in that organization, and what are you working on right now to try to push things forward? So, you know, I was appointed by the board of directors as the interim CEO in May, I was previously serving on the board, so I have a lot of experience with the council, having been a board member for a number of years. I was uh, in my second term as a board member. Um, That's been really comforting, both for me and for the staff, because I think having a new interim CEO that is a known quantity with the staff was really beneficial. I think in the middle of a pandemic, uh, it was a bit... Uh, anxious for me as a new interim CEO and with everyone working remotely. So a lot of the dreams and aspirations that I have for the staff and the CDA candidates around the country and even the world, uh, we really had to take a step back and see how we can support the childcare community in the midst of this um, pandemic. So that's our main focus right now, Chris, really helping support CDA candidates, but also looking to perhaps be a voice for the childcare community who I think will be um, unstable for several years because this pandemic has really decimated the childcare community. Um, And so we are looking to support uh, the childcare workforce in ways that we can to help them both reopen and also do it in a safe and healthy manner. Mm -hmm. Prior to the beginning of the pandemic hitting us, Tell us a little bit about the history of the CDA. Is it, has it been kind of stable and consistent in terms of numbers of people who have their CDA? Has there been periods of exciting growth or has it just been slow and steady? Tell us a little bit. And I don't actually don't know how many people on the planet hold the CDA. So give us some, some stats, if you will, around that. Yeah. So, you know, this is the 45th anniversary of the CDA credential. Um, which began 45 years ago this Mm. year, Uh, the council has not been around that long. You know, when the CDA was created out of um, the Head Start community, uh, it had several iterations in terms of being administered before the council was created in the mid 80s. And so um, in that history, what might amaze you, Chris, is that we believe we have awarded over 800,000 CDAs 
mm. um, in those 45 years. And we, I think before the pandemic, we really, we were in um, a very expanding uh, period for the CDA. I would like to call it the golden years. Uh, we were averaging 40,000 uh, credentials a year, uh, which is an amazing feat for a credential that's been around a long time. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been a sustained effort for the 45 years, and we still have a lot of interest from the childcare community. We were impacted by the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, we were maybe credentialing uh, maybe 600 initial applications every week. Uh, in the midst of the pandemic, we went all the way down to 50. So you can see wow. how dramatic that uh, pandemic impacted us yep. as a council and how it impacted those who wanted to achieve their CDA credential. Mm -hmm. We have bounced back a bit uh, in terms of the numbers. What's been amazing though, Chris, in terms of the renewal applications, you know, a CDA candidate gets the initial credential and um, they have that credential for five years and then they have to renew. The credential, the renewal credential has not been impacted at all during the pandemic. In fact, those numbers have doubled in hmm. the midst of the pandemic. So that's been a silver lining um, here at the council. Well, that's good to know. I suppose that's because people have been home with their centers closed or partially closed, and they've had some time to focus on professional development that they might not otherwise have had. So they utilized it to get their renewals which is a good thing. Absolutely. And let me tell you how this uh, pandemic has really impacted child care um, workers all over the country. We started implementing a leadership and learning series, and we were expecting maybe a couple of thousand people would register for the series. We've had over 65,000 child care professionals register for our learning leadership and learning series, which means not only do they have time to do professional development, they are doing it over and over and over again. And we are so excited that so many of our child care professionals around the country are taking advantage of this time to really shore up their skills and learn perhaps some new skills uh, while they're at home working remotely. Love that. Uh, being the author of a leadership course called Leadership Mastery for Early Educators, uh, of which I'm very proud. I love that people are using this time to get skilled up and get honed up on their leadership. So that makes me super, super happy. That course specifically, tell us a little bit more about that course. Is that something that's like a self-paced or is, do you go through it as a cohort? Can people still join that course? No, it's a, a series of separate learning experience around leadership in the early childhood field. And I think there were, I think in the series, there were about 10 webinars that you could register for individually. They were okay. um, power webinars. It was one hour uh, and um, we opened up the registration and it's just been amazing how well received they've been during the midst of this pandemic. And were they free? They were free. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I hosted a couple of free webinars as well really just helping people get their heads back in the game of going from crisis thinking to from survival to thriving, kind of. That was kind of the theme in late March and early April when we were really in the thick of it. And we had record numbers of attendance. I just think people around our industry, they were looking for connection. They were looking for support. They were Absolutely. afraid. They were looking for help and guidance. And um, we all banded together. And I think we still are banding together. I don't know. Do you get that sense? I do. I think people were looking for ways to connect uh, in this crisis. And we were glad to really provide them an outlet, but mm -hmm. also provide them with new information and new skill sets. I, I will tell you, after hearing about your training that you've offered, maybe we could partner together. You know, we have a network of almost 300,000 folks. And um, we certainly want to partner with those who are interested and have similar missions and uh, give our, our folks um, information that they need to do a great job with children. Love it. Would love to partner. Let's talk a little bit about your role with Head Start. I'm just curious. You've been such a long time 
um, just you're just knowledgeable about Head Start and having been a child that was in it early days. Because I think wasn't Head Start founded right around the time that you were in it? Yeah, I think it was founded in 1964. And okay. when I was in Head Start in 1969, I think it was a still summer program in Alabama. So I went that summer between that summer before I went into kindergarten, right? And so I, I didn't experience the year long program that's offered to folks now. But I will tell you that that experience was really powerful for me. And my Head Start teacher remained a close friend in my family for many, many years. In fact, uh, when she passed away, I was devastated because she made such an impact on me and my siblings uh, because my brothers were also in Head Start. And then um, we had a deep family connection because she and my mother graduated high school together. So she was always part of my family gatherings and I just always felt connected to my Head Start uh, community that way. But when I became a staff member in Head Start, I remembered how powerful her connections were. And so I wanted to be that kind of teacher for mm -hmm. the children and families that I was serving in Head Start. That's the really remarkable part of the program that it helps the child, but it also helps the family to yeah. recognize how important those early connections are around reading and literacy and all the things that we know young children need in those formative years when the brain is making all those connections. Mm -hmm. I will say that I was a radical in Head Start. I believed that every American needed access to a Head Start program, regardless of your socioeconomic background. So um, I don't know if people really like that idea, but I thought that every child deserved a Head Start experience. Well, there's a lot of initiatives right now. There's a brand new movie that just came out. It's not called Zero to Three, but it's zero. I'm spacing it. I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes. But uh, a lot of political will right now for what you just said, which is we need to reexamine the country's approach to early childhood education and the funding and the ability for all families to get quality, affordable, uh, or subsidized early care across the board, across this nation. So um, I agree. And yeah. let me tell you why I agree. Because no matter what your income level is, you should not spend uh, an inordinate amount around um, your budget for child care. And so mm -hmm. whether you, no matter what your background is, every child deserves a high quality experience. And so we should make it available to every American. Um, and I just believe that it should remain a community-based program, but every community, rural, urban, no matter where people are in the country, they have a right to a Head Start experience. Mm -hmm. and, and it's equitable. I believe in equity, which means everyone deserves it. Yeah, and that would be an amazing thing. What I've seen happening, especially during this time of the pandemic, is that countries who have national care are just so much more organized with their approach and the pain and the suffering around administrators and how to deal with all of these different state rules and county rules and health regulations and the CDC mm -hmm. and uh, everybody's interpreting it differently. And, and so you've got this really crazy segmentation. Uh, we serve leaders in the Child Care Success Academy across all 50 states and additionally five to 10 countries actively. And we, you know, we, we try to, we strive to meet everybody's needs across, yes. but it's been so geographically skewed and, un, un, you know, you're not able to even like really help and manage people who might be in a closed state like Massachusetts versus New York City versus DC versus rural Montana, you know, and, and California. So it's like a symptom what's going on right now with all of the stress and differences across our United States with regard to how we treat essentials and child care centers closing and not getting the proper funding and all that. It's just a symptom of the fact that we don't have a national system. And so when things like this happen, it really shows up because the cracks really elevated. And before I left Head Start, I saw how uh, the federal legislatures or legislators uh, supported Head Start. They provided a huge amount of funding for Head Start. And imagine if 
Head Start was available to everyone. That would have been a consistent way to help everyone yes. across this nation. And I think it was a missed opportunity because yeah. what I know about Head Start and Early Head Start is that they really have the infrastructure across the country to implement consistent arrangements, right? That every Head Start, every Head Start grantee was hearing the same message from our Head Start director and the leaders in DC. And it was easy for those things to be passed out among uh, the regional offices. And just imagine if every child was enrolled in Head Start, they would have received the same message, the same kind of support, the same kind of uh, shot in the arm of funding that uh, the Head Start program received uh, during the summer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just one example of how we could have a national program that it has proven results. Um, I do believe that we should be careful with our resources, but if you have a program that's proven that they um, can uh, produce those kinds of results, we should invest in them, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> but what do I know? <laughs> well, it can be a controversial topic, but most of the pro providers and professionals that I know agree that we should be going in this direction. And even, you know, in Washington across the aisle, I mean, I know that Ivanka Trump was pro um, having a national system or at least a, a high quality ECE system. And, right. uh, and so we'll, we'll see what we can continue to do to try to support that. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, book, the one that I mentioned with regard to male teachers. So it's called Men Do Stay, Recruiting and Retaining Qualified Male Early Childhood Teachers. And the reason I wanted to bring this into today's show is because lots of our listeners um, who I work with as clients are very excited to be able to find and retain and hire male teachers. They love having guys in the building. Um, and actually one of our, one of my clients in Kansas and Colorado who was just on the podcast, Pamela, Pamela Pekarski, she, it really likes to actively recruit male teachers and she's a, an early Head Start program. So let's talk a little bit about that initiative or, you know, that concept. Why, uh, is that can there be a stigma or myths around when parents see male teachers present in an early learning center? And how do we as leaders help drive this forward and grow the presence of males in this job? And how do we dispel those myths? Well, Chris, I have studied this topic. It really was my dissertation topic, a male teacher retention. And I really studied a program that had figured it out. And um, if you read my book, you know that I studied five men who worked in a Head Start center. They were all male teachers. And so every classroom at the center had a male teacher. Uh, there was a male center director, a male janitor, and the guy that uh, drove the bus every day with the kids. He was also a man. So I believe it was a very unique program that reached critical mass in terms of male involvement and male engagement. What I learned is that the things that they were doing at that program to retain those men can be done at any program. And I believe that uh, it included a, an active and vibrant professional development experience. Uh, they all received their CDA or were in some type of CDA program or mm -hmm. associate's degree program. And I believe that because of the male leadership at the program, it was easier for men to feel welcomed at that center. And so uh, while we all can articulate the benefits of having men in the childcare uh, arena, uh, there are a lot of myths. Um, even some parents that I interviewed for my dissertation study ad admitted that they were uncomfortable with having a male teacher um, because society, I think, looks at teaching as a woman's job. And so men are uh, maybe averaging two to 3% in the early childhood sector across the world. I mean, and mm. we can't seem to break those numbers. I mean, it's a very consistent data point across the world as I studied the topic. Mm. And I think there are things that we can do to dispel the myths, but I think we have to work together and really have honest conversations. Um, and, and I think some of those conversations have to be had by women in the field, right? right? Because it is a feminized profession. 
And I think we've not benefit, uh, benefited from a diverse uh, child care workforce in a number of ways. I mean, I just believe as a male teacher, uh, it was hard for me to stay and persist in the field because of the, the low wages, um, the lack of benefits. And I think the, the notion that if you're a really good male teacher, we want you to run the program. We want to get you out of the classroom and, and make an administrator out of you. Right. And so we lose uh, really excited and um, bright male teachers to the system itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think that um, a lot of the things that men in our field um, are looked down for, like just the joy of working with young children is a bigger problem than just in the ECE sector. Right. I, mean, I think society has to grapple with the fact that men can teach too. And in some cases we can be better teachers, not uh, in the sense that children uh, prefer a, a one gender over the other. But I think if you get a really bright male teacher, they can really demonstrate that difference between the genders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give you a quick example. When I was a male teacher and two kids started fighting on the playgrounds, my female teacher aide would want to jump in and break the fight up, right? That's what mothers do. They want to solve the conflict. But a male teacher would wait a bit. The male teacher realizes, well, they're not going to break themselves. I mean, they're going to have disagreements. So let me just wait just one beat and see how they resolve it themselves. And I had to help my teacher realize that that's just the difference between a male teacher and a female teacher. Mm -hmm. We may not rush in as, as quickly as uh, our female counterparts, but we are just as, observant, just as observant in the classroom and we love the children just as much as well. Well, I love some of the, you know, the key points and the gems that you just shared there. What I really love as a key point that everybody can take away from this is look back at your program and do some homework around your approach to having a diverse culture in your school in terms of workforce. So do you propagate and market to candidates in a way that supports diversity? Do you have those messages in your hiring ads? Do you have those messages on your careers page on your website? Do you have diverse core values on at your school? Do you have a culture wall that shows diversity? Do you have Oh, images, just images on your website and images in your brochures and your collateral that show diversity, you know, and so that is the start of it is let's just all check in on that because those are easy little homework items to do if you're listening Absolutely. and you want to, and then we can lay the foundation for a diverse workforce and an approach to our school's culture with that as a linchpin. So I love that. And the two to three percent stat is is quite interesting and and scarily low. Um, <laughs> so we have to just do better. We have to be looking at that and driving it forward intentionally. And well, you know, we've been thinking yeah. about that at the council. We had a recent um, social media campaign around men in ECE where we asked folks to nominate a male. We're also going to be having a wonderful event on October first, celebrating the forty fifth anniversary, and we're going to feature Ed Green talking to a group of male CDAs. Uh, so we're trying to do our cool. part to raise the profile of male teachers. Yeah. But listen, I think if we capture those young men in high school, so the high school CDA is where I think we can capture young men interested in working with young children right at the beginning when they're thinking about their careers. If they earn that CDA in high school, we got them. Yeah, I love that. And I love the success stories, interviews, Q&As, yes. capturing some of that goodness on video. Um, and really, you know, I've seen men in action in a preschool, you know, male teachers in action in an after school program or a homework club, or even with the younger ages with toddlers, with song and dance. I've seen them just have these brilliant moments. And especially yeah. for the little boys in the program who might need some more role models Absolutely. in their life. You know, that's just an important thing. Um, now, Chris, for, think about when was yeah. the first time you had a male teacher? Do you remember? I, well, my, the one that comes to mind that just pops for me is I had a very impactful, I had two male teachers in middle school that were very impactful. Uh, one was a language arts teacher who was very much into poetry and got us all into writing poems. And we did a whole poetry book and I still have it. 
And my other one was a science teacher, Mr. Luque. And he took us on really fun walking field trips and we would explore the forests and stuff. And we Yeah, middle for... school is really the, yeah. the, the, the most consistent response I've heard that the first right. time I had a male teacher was in sixth grade or seventh grade. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but it would be great to have, you know, have those experiences pop for all of us in the, for the younger ages, for us to be thinking first grade, second grade, third. Absolutely. And I really think elementary school for me, I mean, I'm, I'm in my young fifties, so I'm dating myself, but, <laughs> <Me> uh, <too>. <laughs> but yeah. So with that, I don't think I had any really till middle school. Um, so let's try to, let's work on that. Let's, if you guys are listening, join us in this effort and this, this initiative, because there's so much brilliance there with our male teachers. And so let's show them some love with some intention That's around right. around your diverse workforce uh, messaging and um, components there. So let's talk a little bit about maybe something that you might've done differently. Is there a career look back moment that if you could have done something differently, you would have in your career, anything you would have changed, anything that comes to mind? I think I've really been fortunate with my choice of career. Um, you know, I, I was in the Air Force. Uh, most people don't know that about me, that I did four years in the Air Force prior to entering the early childhood field. So I, I come to the field uh, really from a different perspective than most uh, because of my military background. Uh, but I would say that uh, when I was in college prior to the military, I wanted to be a news anchor. And that was my first um, notion about what I do as a, an adult. Uh, and even though that didn't work out, uh, I don't have any regrets, but every now and then I use my Midwestern accent and pretend that I'm a news anchor and I have fun <laughs> with my kids reading a, a, a story that I would be presenting uh, on the 5 p.m. news, for example. So I, I do have my, you know, maybe not regrets, yeah. but I do have that what if, right? Right. What if I was Craig Melvin? Or what if I was Brian Williams? Um, I mean, I could have been great. <laughs> could have been one well, of the greats, right, Chris? <laughs> you could have been one of the greats. Well, you're here on Ro Childcare Rockstar Radio, and you're being one of the greats right here. So at least we got you. There you go. There on you the go. mic right here. Um. <laughs> What are you inspired by? What are you reading, watching, listening to right now? Or maybe what have been the most impactful things in your life with regard to, you know, professional development books, things that have been pivotal in your life as you've come up through the ranks? So I'm reading right now a book uh, called The Culture Code, and it's all about what makes successful teams tick. And so I, I started reading the book um, several months ago when I first took this job and I was looking for something to read that would really kind of shape my initial 90 days at the council. And it was so good. I gave it to every member of our board of directors. I wanted them to sort of go on this journey with me. And I was maybe midway the book when I had that idea and I shipped the book out to all of the board of directors. And it was so impactful. I gave it to every member of our staff and we're wow. doing this staff wide book talk around the culture code. It, it's really filled with these uh, examples of, of successful teams around the country and the things that they figured out around what made them achieve that particular goal. And so I, I want us to learn from uh, the anecdotes in the book about how we can rethink uh, our way around problems that we're trying to solve it here at the council. So that's really um, a really good example of how a piece of literature might change um, an, an entire organization, which includes all of our stakeholders, our board, our executive leadership, and even our frontline staff. We're all grappling with this narrative and uh, we're gonna do some action planning around it have some uh, virtual experiences together as we explore the book. And because I'm ahead of everyone, I get to plan those activities and kind of walk through uh, the ones that really make sense for us as a team. Uh, and, but I'm really excited about that. And that's one thing about me. If I get a real good narrative, I chew on it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm glad I found the culture code. They really should um, uh, make every new executive read that book. Right. I've actually heard of that book. I think I have it sitting in my Kindle reader queued up for me because other, other guests 
on this podcast have talked about that book. So I'm glad that you mentioned it as well. That underscored it for me. So now it's, it's going up the list, uh, <laughs> there you go. Dr. Moore. And so um, any other ones that come to mind or any, you know, TED Talks or anything else that you want to mention? Well, I do want to let you know that, that I'm a music fanatic, and I think that music is the universal language. And so I have a very eclectic a musical background. And during this mm. pandemic, I've been recommending to people to really reconnect with uh, music. I've been listening to Billie Holiday. I've been listening to Nina Simone and Marvin Gaye, all of the greats. But I've yep. also been inspired by uh, some, some new artists as well. And so you have to really make sure that that uh, you have uh, your music and your literature in, in um, good play right now, because I think that's how we'll get through uh, these tough times. Yes. And right now, if you look at my playlist, I'm actually listening to um, The Root, which is a piece that was part of the Greenleaf. I don't know if you are familiar with Greenleaf, but it was this uh, soap opera that was on, the, the um, I think it was on OWN, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah okay. Winfrey yeah. Um, network, yeah. But the music really captured me, not the show, but I heard the, the soundtrack. And so I really started listening to it. And uh, because you are uh, another writer who writes about happiness, yeah, uh, you should pick up that piece. Cool. The Roots. It's called The Roots. All right. The Roots. You got it. I'll just check it out. I love Billie Holiday. And um, one of the things we've talked with uh, Dr. Nefertiti Pointer from the Devereaux Institute, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she, yes, I am. she's amazing. And she says a couple things that can help us through these times. One of them is humor. And yes. she's actually quite funny. She cracks me up talking about her Kevin. Um, but she uses humor a lot. And then music as a connecting point and also to help us to stay calm and soothed. And I think with children, oh, um, you know, playing music in your school, looking for different fun music in your entryway in the classrooms, hearing children sing is one of the most beautiful sounds on the planet. So let's not forget that. So thank you for sharing those ideas and thoughts. So let's reconnect with the musical greats. And um, I love that. So that's a homework item. Um, if I, uh, had you put a message to the world on a billboard, what would it say? Let's give every early childhood professional the CDA. All right. I think that's something we can do right now as a country. <laughs> and, um, it will allow us to have this base level of competence across the ECE field. And that's something we can do right now, Chris if we had the will to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with that, what do you think is like the single biggest, um, and maybe you can't pick one, but uh, it, like before CDA, after CDA, for the majority of teachers that you've seen go through that credential, you know, is there like a, a result, an aha, an insight, some kind of a, you know, the, the difference making thing that the CDA fosters and provides? So I'll use myself as an example because, you know, I earned my first CDA in 1992. I told you that I came to this field almost by accident. I was going back to school after having been in the military. And my aunt said, why don't you go work at the Head Start program while you're going to school? Um, I think she was just trying to get me into a job as opposed to <laughs> a full-time student. I, I think that's what she was uh -huh. up to. But I, I took her up on it and I became a Head Start teacher aide. And they put me right into the CDA program almost immediately. And it provided an orientation to the field of early care and education that I don't think I would have gotten if I'd gone into the four-year program as I had planned. And so it allowed me to embrace the field and get some quality work experience at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think the CDA is a vehicle that can help professionalize our field at the beginning of someone's career right, and orientate them about our code of ethics and really get them to buy into the field as a profession. And because it was an early experience for me, my ideas about how children grow and learn, 
they were set on fire. I mean, I, 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 I just wanted to learn more. I became like a sponge. After earning my CDA, I went right into a four-year program. I got my bachelor's degree. And then I went right into a master's program and ultimately the PhD. I really believe the CDA catapulted me into mm -hmm. a lifelong learning about child development that mm -hmm. I don't think I would have discovered otherwise. Right. Well, that's, and that's an amazing... For yeah. every, every teacher on their way to the bachelor's degree to get a CDA. Right. Yeah, that firsthand testimony right there is, you know, proof in the pudding. And you're right. It should be um, something that all leaders tell their new their new teacher applicants that we want to give this to you as part of your professional development. This is the path. Yes. We want you to be with us over the next 18 to 24 months at a minimum. And this is the journey of what we're going to invest in you. Yes. And this is what our relationship and our partnership is going to be so that we can make sure that children are provided the top level of care, of quality care, and, and that you're, you know, you've got this, this amazing um, start to being a great, yes. the best teacher that you can be. So that's right. If you're listening to this podcast as a leader, director, owner, and you're not doing that, then maybe there's a homework item as well to strongly consider Dr. Calvin Moore's advice and go in that direction for every single person that you hire and just make that investment. And I think that we would see just, that would be just a payoff that we would see over time across the industry. Absolutely. Um, do you have a sense for what percentage of new teachers in their first year get the CDA or what's the adoption rate of the CDA across the industry? Any stats that you can share I, in that? I do know that there are areas of the country that really support the CDA. Like we have big consumers in Texas, and Florida. New York is another big consumer of the CDA. Um, in, on the East Coast, there are huge supporters of the CDA and they've strengthened scholarship programs. I think uh, teach programs across the East Coast support the CDA as uh, an entry level, base level credential that uh, teachers need, but we have pockets of the country that either don't know enough about the CDA or they embrace maybe a state credential like in California as a price. Right. But right. I do believe that um, we only reach a small percentage of the millions of child care workers uh, who are working with children every day. And because of the turnover rate, uh, one wonders how we can have any consistent practice going on. Um, yes. Like I said, we credential around 40,000 people, but you do know that there are millions of people, hardworking folks working with young children every day. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, th that's a great message to leave the listeners with. And um, hopefully everybody will go take action on that. If they want to learn more about you, how can we find you uh, on the wonderful world of the internet or what's your preferred mode of contact if people want to reach out? So it's amazing. You can Google me and find me on the internet, which is really weird. Almost, but <laughs> I do have an email at the council, which is Calvin M at CDA uh, You certainly can find me there. That's what, that's where I work every day. Okay. I do have a website, the CDA council, uh, dot org, And right. you can also go there to reach me. I think my email address, my phone number is there if people want to reach out to me. Um, and so I'm eager to hear from folks who are working in the field. Um, you know what, Chris, I'm a teacher by trade. All of my degrees are in education. I wish I was sitting in front of a, 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 a circle of 18 four-year-olds because, I mean, in my heart, at my core, I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. and I know there are others like me who have that same core. So yeah. let's connect, let's talk, and let's reminisce about the good old days. I love it. I love it. It's so good. You know, I never was a teacher, but I always said when I was a little girl that I was going to be. And I'm a teacher of adults because I'm a coach and I'm a trainer. I'm a professional developer. So I'm a yeah. teacher of adults, not little ones, but I did volunteer a lot when my kids were in elementary school as lunch mm -hmm. mom and helper. I was the math tutoring helper 
in my son's, in my son's room. And I always love when I walk into the school, I would get this feeling, you know, this vibe, this like awesome excitement of, you know, just that energy, that energy and that passion, you could feel it. So even though I didn't go down that path in my career, I always enjoy being in a school. And to this day, um, I look forward to getting back to being able to visit some of our clients post COVID so I can get back into early learning schools and hang out with the babies. Yes, I'm praying for post-COVID. <laughs> I can hardly wait. <laughs> Me too. So I actually joked at one point I was going to buy an RV and I was just going to drive around the country and go visit all of my friends. And they were like, come on, bring your mask. <laughs> come <good> on. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been a great, great uh, show. Dr. Calvin Moore, um, it's been wonderful to have you here. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, you're more than welcome. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you for lifting your voice and supporting our field. You're welcome. And, and you the same. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here with us again at Child Care Rockstar Radio. Uh, go get your people to get their CDAs. And Absolutely. read about how to make the teachers more happy. And get Dr. Moore's book. Um, what's the book again? The, ma- the male teacher book? Men Do Stay. Men do stay. Uh, it's on Amazon. Male early childhood professionals. That's right. right. Cool. Well, thank you again so much. Uh, take care and God bless everybody. And we'll see you next time. Ciao for now.